You know, many people have asked me over the many years, how can a so-called loving God exist? And if he does exist, why does he allow all this evil to be happening in the world today? One cannot stop to ponder this question after all the horrific murders, the rapes, the microwaving of babies in the war in Israel, slaughtering of whole families, rapes, murdering, pillaging, stealing, which is happening in Israel and Ukraine. And people say to me, how can a loving God look at all of this if he exists? <clears throat> it just seems to be war and hatred everywhere across the face of the planet and there just doesn't seem to be any end in sight. And it just appears to me to be to be no sign of peace anywhere, just an explosion of pure evil in the face of the world. Everywhere you look, on the news, on the television, in the papers, everything is just a sign of pure evil that's covering the face of the earth. And the question is why? And people ask if a so called loving God exists and allows this to carry on, I don't want to have anything to do with it. You may not even look at the imminent war three that's about to happen. Maybe you're asking the same question of betrayal in your own family, hatred amongst your friends at work, separation of friends, divorce, abuse in the workplace, family violence that's rampant, or even allowing a little baby to die in a microwave oven. These questions are real questions to people. Just why does a loving God look at all these and doesn't intervene? And the age-old question, why does God allow the suffering in the world to continue that we're looking at on the internet day after day after day? It all depends what kind of answer you're looking for. <clears throat> Are you looking for an answer to say, ha ha ha, I told you so, God doesn't exist at all. Or are you willing to accept the reality that it's only God that can give this perfect answer and that God chose in his word not to give us that perfect answer simply because he is God? And why didn't he, didn't he do that? I can't tell you. And besides that, nor can you and nor can anybody answer this question. Even Jesus at the cross asked this question. He asked the very same question on the cross when he was there to pay for our sins. And he said to the Father, if it's possible, would you please take this cup away from me as he hung on the cross for us? We were the ones that should be on the cross. But he asked this question, why am I suffering here? And if you're looking for a perfect answer today, I do not think you're going to get one from me. You're not going to get this one some, from somebody else and you're not going to get it from the other side until we get to the other side of eternity. But I can tell you God will use all the evil to bring about his plan and his perfect will into our lives and I have no clue why. In fact, you don't have an answer. But it's only sometimes when we look back on life and in our circumstances we see why tragedy happened. With the horror of October the 7th, many Jews by the thousands are coming to the Wailing Wall, wall repenting and giving their lives back to Christ, the numbers seen never before. Many Jews are filling up the Christian churches across the United States of America, looking for the, the why answer and coming to Christ and sitting in churches and seeking the Messiah. But if you're looking for the assurance to trust God in the light of whatever situation you're finding yourself in, I can direct you. And one thing for sure, I can assure you that God is all good. I can assure you that he is all just. I can assure you that he's all knowing. I can assure you that he's all seeing, ever present, or powerful, or wise, or hearing our prayers, and that he is in total control. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose within you. So the question is that remains, where is God in all this evil? Where is God in this hurting? Where is God in our loneliness? Where is God when people suddenly turn on us? Where is God when our marriage doesn't work out and things seem to be on the rocks? Where's God when a business deal goes sad? 
Why are the most unlikely people in the church have treated us in a manner that we never expected? Please, I ask you please to eradicate all this from your mind. God doesn't owe us an answer. Plus your life is held securely in the palm of his hand. In Isaiah 46, he says, Even to your old age, I am he. And even to your grey hairs, I carry you to the grave. I have made you, and I will bear. Even I will carry and will deliver you. Folks, God owes us nothing. He doesn't owe us an answer. He has already given us his all. He's given us his life by the shedding of blood so that we may have eternal life irrelevant of the circumstances that may surround us and all the evil that seems to be on the news. Some of us may assume God is like a servant, a slave, a quick prayer, a click of the fingers, and suddenly he becomes a magician. Yet this is not how God operates, and that's not the response of God. The Word of God declares that there are many mysteries in the Word of God, and he chooses not to tell us. He chooses not to declare the mysteries for some reason. But when we all get to heaven, you'll know why, and then and only why, then you'll know why. You'll know the answer. You'll see the answer. And you'll see why he didn't kowtow down to every whim and fancy and question. And if he did reveal everything, we would be serving just another man-made puppet who does not have to explain anything to us. And now we serve a risen saviour who lives in the world today, but one that has all knowledge and all power and all knowing, knowing all our comings and goings. And it'll only be in heaven when we will all have the answers to your questions. And you'll look back in life and in heaven and the veil will be open and all revealed. Only then will you see the answers to your question. The Bible says we will know him and we shall be like him, but for now we are to live by faith, to fully trust him, and even when we are perplexed, even when we're disturbed, even when we can't see where we're going, and even when we don't know what to do, and even when we fail to understand without all the answers. You know, when I stop and think about all the book of Job, it's a book about pain and suffering, a book that makes absolutely no sense at all to common man. And with all this going on, Job's life, he begins to question God and says, why, why, why God? At times we always ask the question, why, why, why me? And there's nothing wrong with asking the question why. And at the end of the book, Job's God reveals some answers to Job. Didn't necessarily answer all the questions, but he answered some of them. And he begins to ask Job this question. Who created you, Job? Who created the heavens and the earth, Job? Who can judge the earth, Job? Who knows more than God? Who can see more than God? Who can intervene more than God? Who can intervene more when it comes to our trials and tribulations and injustices more than God? The answer, folks, is no one. And you know, many of us want to help God. We want to give him a helping hand up. We want to give him some help when we think he's lost the plot but the question is do we have perfect knowledge (laughs) do we have perfect knowledge about the universe and about our lives and do we even bother to believe the word of God that he has a plan for your life do I have all the answers to life of course not do you have all the answers to life no one has There are a group of people in the Bible described as the Pharisees. And folks, we've got plenty of Pharisees in our modern intellectual society. Pharisees in the universities, Pharisees in the education system, Pharisees in government. And even, dare I say it, we've got Pharisees in the church that believe and think that they may know more than God. People have said to me some really ridiculous, absurd things at times, like they said to Job, Oh, I know why you're suffering. I know why you're going through difficult times. We know why your business isn't going so well. We know why all your friends have left you. We know why your marriage is a mess. We know the pain you're going through. We know why God allowed me to break my leg. I get all of this all the time, every day. Oh, I know. And the answer to this is quite simply, they say to us, because you're a sinner. And folks, we are sinners. 
that we see a clear answer the way Jesus answered this question to his disciples and to the, to, to the, and to the Pharisees. Neither this man nor his parents have sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so the word of God might be displayed in him. You see, they got it wrong. Who sinned, this man or his parents? Neither, this man nor his parents. And it's so easy to jump to the conclusion and forget the verse that he has a plan and a future and a hope for people and the, the word of God. You see, like many of us, we think we have all the answers and above God. And my advice to you is to be very, very cautious to jump to conclusions outside the word of God before you start putting the finger and putting God on trial for all the mess in the world and the mess in people's lives and accuse them of doing the wrong thing and not caring about the suffering in the present world and trials, but rather begin to look at what the, he did for you at the cross of Calvary, the perfect sacrifice of a sinless man that hung on the cross and took all your sins and nailed them to the cross. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. The question I have for you today is this. Was that fair that he should stand in our place? For we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, for we are all sinners. Was it fair that he took the punishment that belongs to us? Of course not. In the word of God, the only thing that explains how demonically evil entered, entered the world and explains how to... The stain of sin left as an ugly mark on the face of the planet clearly outlines the consequences of sin of mankind and how God dealt with that sin once and for all by dying and giving up his son. It clearly outlines how a loving God had a remedy for our evil since he did not spare even his own son but gave him up for us all. Won't he also give us everything we require and look after us? It's not up to us to question God, folks. But it's up to us to accept the new gift that God has given to all mankind. A new heart, a new set of eyes, a new way of thinking, a new mind, a new way of living, a new spirit. Then and only then will you become, begin to understand the magnitude of evil that is manifesting its ugly head in the world today. And it's only then will you understand that God is in total control and all things, say all things, all things, everything works out for good to those that love him and accord according to his purpose so that we might be crafted into the image of his dear son. And the question is what purpose? The purpose is this, Jeremiah says, for I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. No matter what's going on in your life, no matter where we question whether God exists at night or not, God has a future and a hope for us and amongst the difficult circumstances of life. And Romans says, what should we say in response to all of this? If God is for us, who could be possibly against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how we... How will he not also, along with him, give us all things freely? For your sake we have faced death all, long, all day long. We are considered as sheep to the slaughter. And this is what Paul says, going through all of his sufferings and trials at the time. No, no, in all things, Paul says. Not some things, all things, but all things. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us and died for us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither present nor future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor any else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Even the things, the evil things that are happening in the world, the things that we question, will never separate us from the love of God. Will never separate us from the fact that he has a plan and a purpose for us, and has a plan for good and not for evil. And lastly, here is my question to you. A question that needs to be answered by every, every single man, boy, woman and child. If that question is keeping you awake at night, preventing you from coming to God, I'm asking you to humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. Look up and say to God, all things are in your hands. All my life is in your hands, not mine. You are the final judge and I am not. You are all knowing and I am not. You are all seeing and I am not. You are all sovereign over all the earth and I am not. And ask God to give you a new heart, a new spirit, and a new set of eyes that you may be able to see this question in a different light. So you'll see the world from God's viewpoint. So you'll see from his word and not from your own opinions and earthly desires and earthly education, your own ideas. 
For my thoughts, the word says, are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways. And then, and only then, will you come to the realisation that God is not the author of evil, because evil will never come, overcome the blood of the Lamb or hinder his long-term plan for your life, and that evil one will one day be chained up and thrown into the lake of fire for all those that trusted in Yeshua, and you will rejoice around the throne, worshipping him forever and ever. Romans 8, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Cheer up, folks. Cheer up each other with these words with these assurances that Paul leaves us. Folks, continue to trust in the Lord, for he has all things under his feet. Let's pray. Father, help us to believe that all things work out for good, so that we might be shaped in the image of his dear son, that you have a future and a hope for each one of us. And even if we do not see or understand and ask the question, why, like Job, please increase our faith and knowledge that you love us and that you died for us and the sufferings that we are going through now are only temporary and nothing to be compared for what you have in store for those that love him. For those that love him and have eternity written on their hearts, we ask you to bless us this week. Amen.